Yeah, so we, we'll go ahead and get started um, out of respect for folks' time. We uh, we certainly appreciate everyone for joining us for this legislative advocacy slash lobby day training. Um, for those of you who um, have participated in the past, you know this is our effort um, to really invest in your leadership. Dream.org. Uh, it puts on a series of, of trainings um, and seminars um, to, to really help us, or should I say help you be better at what you do. Uh, and so as you participate in today's um, training, you know, we ask that you do so um, and, and open up and, and share. Um, we want this to be not just something that's coming from us, but uh, we want you to be active participants in it, and we invite that. Uh, and so if you have questions, uh, feel free to put it in the chat, uh, raise your hand, um, and then we'll have some breakout sessions as well. Uh, my name, by the way, is Candia Milton. I am the policy director uh, for Dream.org. My primary responsibilities are to advance our federal legislative uh, priorities. Uh, many of you know that to be the Equal Act, which was just recently reintroduced uh, in this session of Congress, um, and we will be actively participating in seeing that bill become the law of the land, ultimately eliminating the disparity between crack cocaine and powder cocaine sentencing at the federal level. Uh, but I'll also turn it over to my colleague, uh, who will be co-facilitating this training? Uh, he he's relatively new, so we we we've thrown him right into the fire. Uh, my good friend out of the great state of Michigan, Josh Ho. Hey everybody, yeah, I am Josh Ho, and yes, that is my real last name. Uh, let me tell you, that was I am formerly incarcerated, and that was a heck of a fun last name to have while you were in prison. Uh, <laughs> I'm also the host of a podcast called Decarceration Nation, and I've been working uh, at a number of different organizations at passing legislation for most of the last 10 years. I've been part of teams working to pass the Federal First Step Act, uh, Clean Slate Reforms in Michigan, and a long list of bills that implemented the recommendations of the Joint Task Force on Jail and Pretrial Incarceration here in the lovely state of Michigan. I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Uh, I believe I am the policy manager now at dream.org. And uh, I believe that means I'll be helping to manage the state campaigns and also working to help out on the federal stuff. Uh, I have a little bit of experience with both. Uh, anyway, again, thrilled to be here again and uh, great to be on the team. And hopefully I'll get to meet all of you as this goes on. I think I saw some people in the in the, in the the chat that I already know. Yeah. Um, and if you don't mind, Harris, before Harrison, before we get into the the presentation, I'd like to plug our day of empathy. Uh, many of you uh, might be familiar with our uh, the concept of our day of empathy, but we are in the midst of our day of empathies, uh, which is really the largest um, single day gathering of of action for criminal justice reform. Um, and I think what, what today, tomorrow was, I'm sorry, today was Wisconsin. I know we're doing some things in in Arizona. Harrison, is it today? Arizona's yeah. today. Arizona mm -hmm. is today. We're, we're doing some things online with Michigan tomorrow. Uh, but if you go to our website, uh, and if someone can put in the chat any information with regards to our day of empathy, um, and to the extent that you are in any of those states, please feel free to, to sign up and participate. Um, your participation is welcome, um, and not only welcome, but needed, quite frankly. Um, and so uh, Day of Empathy is, we're in the season, if you would. Um, so we wanna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm always proud of this this picture here uh, to launch off this this particular training. Uh, this represents the day where we came together and really kicked off um, our lobby engagement for our federal legislative policy. And who you see standing there is 
our team that is our Federal Legislative Advisory Council, um, who is chiefly responsible for us getting 11 Republican co-sponsors in the Senate for the Equal Act last session of Congress. We'll go to the next slide. And, you know, often, well, let me take a step back. What we want to do in today's training is really demystify this concept that is lobbying. Uh, we want to give greater, uh, make it reachable. Uh, those who are afraid of this concept and meeting with legislators, we want you to either feel more comfortable or simply embrace the tension uh, and then get more comfortable as you engage the process. But really lobbying is nothing more than communicating what your legislative uh, priorities are and really seeking to have an impact on what is a political process. Um, and it's important to recognize that as you engage this process um, that you have power uh, when you, as a citizen, as a constituent, express what it is you want. Let's go to the next slide. But the question is, have you built the power? Um, you know, the, why, why, should, why should someone want to hear from you? And so when I ask the question, have you built the power? Uh, you know, so often we think of ourselves as individuals, uh, but really our power is derived from us coming together uh, within our states, within our districts, uh, and making our collective voices heard. Uh, if I were to ask you, what's most, what's the most important thing for a politician? Uh, many of you might state it's to get reelected. Uh, but and if you're showing up, you're certainly making a statement that you're watching what they're doing. Um, and so when you show up, it's an expression of why they should listen to you when you come in mass. We can go to the next slide. So right now, I'm going to ask a series of questions um, that we're going to we're gonna one, get your initial reaction to, um, and then I'm gonna sort of respond and then we will go out into a breakout session. So folks, if you can get out your phones and either scan the QR code or go to menti.com and enter the code that you see on your screen, this is gonna enable you to participate in the quiz that we have. So I'm gonna give it um, about 60 to 90 seconds just so folks can um, get ready on there and then um, we'll get started. We've got a five question quiz for you all just to familiarize yourself with some of these core concepts. I'm just gonna give it just a second. And let me know if you're struggling with uh, how to get on and um, I can help you out. Again, you can do this from your phone or your computer. I'm actually gonna participate from my phone. And each of these questions will have a timer um, of about 15 seconds. Uh, they will be true or false questions. And the uh, faster that you answer, the higher the points you get, and there will be a winner. So I'm going to refrain from answering quickly because <laughs> I don't wanna be the winner. Uh, but just know that there are points involved and um, maybe maybe one of these days a, a real uh, a real life prize. Um, we haven't talked about that, but uh, we'll see. All right. And Tori's getting the prompt ready for the breakout. We'll we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, all right, Candia, you ready? I'm ready. Are you All coming right. with the results? We're going to uh, open up the, the quiz now. Okay. All right.
First question. Lobbying is the political process to move policy initiatives, true or false? So you'll see the options on your phone, hit true or false based on what you think. Slow. There we go. Nice. Overwhelmingly uh, correct. Um, now let's move to the next question. Government is in the business of picking winners and losers. True or false? Now, Sheila, you mentioned you weren't able to get in, and, and that's fine. We're going to have a, a discussion on these items uh, and, and, and break out. Okay. I see. <laughs> Ooh. Interesting. This is all, this is all, Harrison, I told you, this is always the fun one right here. Yeah, do you want to touch on this one a little bit before we move on to the next question? Um, no, so we're going to go through them afterwards, are we? Each one? Yeah, 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 we can. Yeah, so let, let's. All righty. Next question. 15 seconds. All politics is local. You may have heard this expression before might be you know new to you totally fine if you've never heard this before we'll explain it in a little bit all right ooh interesting okay very very interesting to see the uh the different responses to these but candia will break these down yeah, yeah. all right question 4 or 5 A decision to get out of politics does not divorce you from politics and its impact on you. Three, two, one. Let's see. Nice, overwhelmingly correct. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a good one about political apathy and all of that. All right, final question. Remember, the faster you answer, the more points you get. Relationships are paramount. Get to know your politicians. And if you have a relationship with an elected official of any level, I would love to see that in the chat, if you can just uh, validate that point, yes or no. True, there we go. Wow. Nobody okay. got it wrong. Awesome. <laughs> All righty. Oh, that, so, gonna... so I've never used this Mentimeter before, and I'm actually, I, I like it. Um, it's, a, it's a good way of engaging and getting a sense of where people are. Um, so let's go ahead and talk through. So it looks like we did have one winner. Somebody named QT. Um, congrats, whoever you are. Hey, Quentin Thomas. We'll have to uh, get you something. I'll, I'll follow up. But uh, congratulations. Uh, runner up, we have Hola Hop and The Hustler, Brand the Broken, Clippy, Darcy, Cinnamon. Cinnamon, we see you. Uh, yeah, give, give Quentin some uh, congratulations, some kudos in the chat. I we'll also want to give slides. congratulations to Brand the Broken for for Game of Thrones love. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. No, and I, I appreciate um, you know folks' participation and you know the even where we may have a lack of agreement, right, um, as relates to these the five things that we were asking you um to accept this truth um it, it, you know a lot of this can be a a matter of perspective 
Um, but let's go over the the questions that we were asking you to respond to in a true or false fashion. And I'll just sort of give you my perspective on why I uh, accept the five following as truths, right? You know, it's a political process. Um, you know, the politicians are driving this process. Uh, you know, these are elected officials who are driving this process. It's always very interesting to me when people run for office and say, well, I'm not a politician. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you're engaging in a process um, such as running for office, such as passing bills, such as engaging colleagues who are doing the same and trying to move them one way or the other, then you are by definition a politician. Uh, and this is a political process. And we are in invariably and undoubtedly a two party system um, where you, there is a lot of give and take in that process. Um, and so that's why I ask that you accept this number one is true. Um, number two is always an interesting one for me. Um, and, you know, government is in the business of picking winners and losers. Now, it's not the official business of government uh, to, to pick winners and losers, but by way of the process, um, that's, what, that's what happens, right? I mean, there is a limited pot of money uh, and you have people often going to the capital within your states or even um, in the nation's capital. One side is arguing for one pot of money, one, you know, a certain pot of money to go toward their cause or issue, and the other is arguing for the opposite. Um, some want more spending, some want less spending. Uh, and so in that scenario, they're picking who gets it and who doesn't, and or who wins and who doesn't lose. Uh, there's someone for your bill, someone against the bill, uh, and you might be against it and others might be for it. And so the decisions, they're picking winners and losers. Um, and so that that's how I, why I come up with, with that statement and accept it as true. Politics are local. All of it is local. Um, you know, I can tell you, we don't, if we even take a look at the federal level and the things that we're doing at the federal level, I talked about our federal legislative advisory council, right? And how impactful they are or were when it came to us getting 11 Republican co sponsors. We are not able to get a meeting in Congress without having strong people from that legislator's district. Um, and because what the politicians even in DC recognize is that at some, day, at some level, they have to come back to their district and respond to their constituents. And so when the constituents ask for a meeting, however, uh, you know, even though they're in DC, they recognize that they need to be responsive um, and they grant meetings uh, even though uh, they are not locally, or should I say local officials, they're federal officials. Um, this one, I think everybody agreed with, a decision to get out of politics does not, do, does not divorce you from politics and its impact on you. Right, Harrison, did everybody agree on that or was there some yeah oh wait no that was that was the very last one that was unanimous oh the last one was unanimous um uh you know what i'm gonna throw it over to 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 you josh and and get your your reaction here are we on all politics is local is that the one no a decision to get out of politics doesn't divorce you from politics oh, right. and its impact on you yeah i mean this is kind of a matter of perspective, but, you know, uh, if, for instance, you say, I just don't want, uh, everything's fine with me. I don't want to be bothered by politics. Like you hear this in sports a lot. What you're really saying 
is that you support the status quo and that is political. You know, almost everything that people do, it may not be like party political, but it supports a point of view. And that point of view is self-interested and kind of this notion that you can kind of suspend, that you can just become kind of an objective being that kind of floats above all the things that were in the muck here in, in, in the world, uh, I think is, 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 is naive. Now, there are other ways to look at it, but I tend to think that all uh, things that we do are embroiled in who we are and represent our self-interests, and those are political. Uh, so I tend to think that the decision not to get out of politics is a decision usually to support a status quo, and that status quo is a particular kind of politics. Mm -hmm. All right. And then I think everybody agree that relationships are paramount, uh, and it's important to get to know your politicians. Um, you know, I, I use these this as an example all the time. I mean, you know, it's if anybody, if you all know Harrison, you know it's hard to say no to Harrison, right? Um, and however, if I had no idea who he is, um, I, you know, I'm not inclined to return his phone call. Um, so I think, you know, we all agree with this statement, so I don't need to go too deep into it. But it's tough to say no to somebody that you know, uh, at least you're able to get a meeting based on relationship. Uh, but what we wanna do is take some time for you all. We, we've discussed our perspective, uh, but we're gonna send you into breakout groups um, and have you talk about these five truths and your reactions to them. Um, you know, what, what is it about any of these statements that, that resonate with you? Um, where is the tension for you? Um, is there anything that, that you struggle with and need greater clarity on? Um, and, and, you know, to the extent that you disagree with, with what we said, which is fine, um, you know, express why in the breakout groups. And so you can choose any one of these five pillars Welcome everybody. So good to have you back. Is he? Yeah, there we go. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, we had a a robust discussion in in our session, uh, but I think each session was to assign someone to report out. Um, so let's go with who who's group number one. Who want, who's reporting out for group number one? Since nobody else jumped in, I'll um I'll jump in. Hi, I'm Margo. Um, we uh so so I I would offer that I have a little bit of a different perspective than the way it was framed today, which is um you know there's a legal distinction between being a lobbyist and a citizen who organizes for your community. Um, so we basically talked about the power of getting together, right? As you guys started to inform us before we went to the breakout sessions there's power in numbers. And so being able to get together the folks in your community who um, are passionate about um, whatever it is that you are also passionate about, the, the more that you're able to bring them with you and, and create events and, and this kind of stuff and have a show of force, that's a big part of affecting change. Um, I also want to offer um, if people want to put their LinkedIn, that this is a great opportunity for us to start building those coalitions. So I'm really into criminal justice reform, community college education reform, and I'll put that in the chat, but um, encouraging folks to take this as an opportunity to start to, to make those friends um, and link in to galvanize our, our shared power. And I'm in South Carolina, if anybody else is down here. Awesome, thank you so much, Margo. Yeah, definitely uh, share your contact information in the chat if you feel comfortable. Um, share your LinkedIn's, all of that, Twitter's. Right. All right, let's 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 go to the share back from um, group two, government picks winners and losers. Candia's favorite. <laughs> go ahead, Nick. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Nikki Davison. I, I love my group. I came in a little late. 
Uh, and the funny thing is I chose it just because we only had three participants and I wanted to even it out. Uh, but it was one of those uh, statements that I believe from the consensus is hard to face that it could even possibly true. I think there's a part of us that wants to reject the uh, a reality that uh, politicians choose winners and losers. And, and I loved how wide we spoke about it, not just winners and losers as far as uh, elected officials, but even um, past le legislation. So I missed when we covered it, but I loved how much we talked about all aspects of what is a winner and loser. And then the other thing I learned uh, too, is there's even a way to look at the concept of winning and losing from a different perspective of time constraints and reality when we talk about uh, legislation. And even from a, it's from the, it's not a purpose to be mean because I was saying that uh, I used to work in the entertainment business and living in DC, I found out that politics is very much like the entertainment business. And uh, the people on top choose everything and what goes, it's just the truth because we're a top down society. And even if it's the upside down of the theory of democracy, it is the way that we function. So, uh, so I just loved hearing from everyone. I can't wait till we see more stuff on it. And for me, um, watching things happen live in DC, especially over the last um, uh, six years, I know how true this is. So I'm so glad we put it up there and I can't wait until we, keep forming democracy into what we want to believe instead of uh, where it is. But I love accepting where it is. All right. Number three, all politics, they're local. Who, who, who's speaking up for that group? We were too busy talking to pick someone, but I can go. I took some notes. Um, I'm Adrian. I live in Seattle. Um, and we had several first timers here, which was great. Um, and some really common themes around the importance of relationships at the local level um, with our families, our friends, um, our neighbors, and really wanted to get people more involved at that level, not just to impact local and regional politics, although I I said, I feel like we can actually have more impact at that level, but also to impact much bigger issues that if we get enough people together who actually know each other, we can get stuff done. Um, we also talked about local officials need to know what we're passionate about. So they won't know if we don't tell them, they'll just keep doing what they're doing. Um, and let me see. Um, someone also mentioned the importance of engaging youth um, mm -hmm. who have lots of feelings about this stuff, but aren't necessarily getting as involved as they could. I think I got everything. If every, anyone else has something I forgot, please share. So, yeah, I like that um, engaging future leadership today, right? Um, number four speaks to political apathy getting out of politics doesn't mean that it doesn't affect you um that's number who's group number four who's speaking out for them that group all right political apathy yeah everybody pretty much agreed that political apathy is a problem uh and uh it boils down for a lot of people to a uh, short-term thinking versus long-term thinking most of the big problems that are facing the United States, and even at this point in time, communities all across America, are not quick fix problems. They're problems that, that need a lot of teamwork, a lot of effort, a lot of work. And uh, frankly, a lot of citizens are, are very busy taking care of themselves. So if they don't get it solved quickly, it's very easy to see how they become apathetic, walk away from the political process, and never look back, which is, you know, an affirmation of the status quo. So it's self-defeating. So, so the apathy problem is a massive problem. In fact, in, in, in my own opinion, it's, it's probably the biggest core problem that, uh, that the country faces. And, and the group pretty much agrees with that, with that sentiment. If anybody else wants to add anything, jump in. Um, I mentioned that I think political apathy also is a stereotype against uh, 
different races, particularly black people, that we don't care. And um, like I was telling the group, uh, my organization ran a campaign last year specifically targeting black Kentuckians. And we found that to be absolutely not true. Black Kentuckians do care about politics. They do care about policy. They are being blatantly ignored. We are being blatantly ignored. I, I, let me correct myself. We are being blatantly ignored. So when we knock on doors and we engage voters of all races, then I think we can attack political apathy with love and care and showing people that we actually do care and, and more on a transformational level than transactional. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Say that. All right. Relationships with politicians are paramount. Relationships and politics are paramount. Who, what group, who was in that group? Number five. Yeah. Um, yeah. I volunteered and um, yeah. So just like with my coalition that I'm um, forming, um, I'm actually, I have an upcoming um research at the, at the legislator that I'm going to be presenting on March 6th. So um, I've been reaching out, contacting legislators, um, planning meetings with them prior um, to presenting. And I'm um, just, you know, telling my story, telling them, you know, our backgrounds, um, like the senator that I reached out to, um, he had two moms growing up. So the way I related to, I, I lost my mom at a young age. So I was like, well, we have con contrasting um, experiences growing up. That um, you know, I, I still believe that the you know family foundation is what paramount, and you know, just um, telling my story of being just as impacted, um, that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, just um, building connections on like a personal level. Um, and in the past, it's been difficult because you know I um, just due to uh, uh, being discredited due to my past criminal past. You know what I mean? But um, it's been several years since then where I've kind of um, been able to transform myself just through, you know, um, just through personal action and um, steps that improve my life. And so. Uh, so, you know, Zach spoke to the importance of establishing common ground, but also utilizing your story, right, to help build relationship and rapport. Um, and, yeah. And then um, I also yeah. want to acknowledge, like, um, any, like, criminal justice reform is it has the bipartisanship while I may not agree with a lot of conservatives, um, reform alliance within our state, they're having a lot of um, success passing through probation, reentry, they're working on um, education, work credits, um, you know, so not alienating, not looking at, um, you know, especially in this political climate as looking at people at others, um, you know, just reaching across the aisle, you know, because to get anything done at the national state level, I mean, I know we're all in different state climates, but it's gotta be bipartisanship and call, call people in, not calling out. Right. So, yeah. And so we'll, we'll get to certainly get to that as a part of um, today's uh, training as well. Um, and Kendi, I see that uh, the one and only Michelle Smith has her hand raised as well. If you want to. Oh, ML, you, you can, okay. You're in a breakout too. I see you. Okay. Go ahead. ML. Yeah, I was. I, honestly, I've just been listening. And Harrison, I'm one and only. I guess so. Um, <laughs> I wanted to add something to the. Um, but first, I'm I'm Emma Smith. I'm the empty leader from Missouri. Um, for those who don't know me, I wanted to add something about the the relationship. So, I wanna, and I don't know if everybody is familiar with this term, but um, there is something about you have to power map our politicians. And power mapping is something where you're really learning about them, not just per se building a relationship, but learning you know, um, what churches they go to, what organizations they belong to, you know, why they would support certain legislation and why they wouldn't. And really power mapping will give you an insight into you know, who this person is, uh, what, what, you know, what uh, drives them, what turns them off, etc. And um, I think that's really important. Another important thing is getting to know their legislative assistants. A lot of times you're not necessarily going to get on a first name basis with a politician. However, if you know the people in their office, you know what I'm saying, if you know the, the lady that does their scheduling, and you know, their assistant that, you know, um, puts stuff in front of them, that's very helpful. So I think in addition to just relationships with them and, you know, um, getting to know them and telling them who you are, et cetera, 
it is really about like knowing where they come from. Like sometimes politicians belong to sororities or fraternities. Maybe you still know somebody, you know, in that similar, you know, same sorority or fraternity that can reach out to them or a church group or a school or any anything of that nature. Um, and I have a great example. So in my state, we my organization, we put we um are fighting against this one particular bill. And this particular bill keeps getting introduced every single year. And so this uh, legislator, he keeps fighting it, right? And so we're, you know, we have to figure out why. What the issue was, he was the judge 10 years ago that put this man on death row. So now he's a state rep. So he's trying to stop us from getting a bill passed to help people on death row because he was someone who put the person on death row who was affected by this. So now that we understand why he's so gung-ho on you know, killing our bill literally every single year, we got a more of an insight to like try to figure out how to move around him, et cetera. But unless you really know like what 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 buttons to push or where these people stand on certain things, you're gonna be in the dark when they support something or or don't support something that you really want passed. So it's really about like doing that detective work and finding out who they are. Um, so I just wanted to to leave everyone with that as well. And that is a part of relationships also. So Right. That's my two cents. All right. No, thank you. And um, certainly we'll touch on just that in our, as a part of the, the training. Um, so we go go ahead and get back to the, the presentation. Thanks, ML, for sharing. And so what we're going to talk a little bit about, too, is how, you know, to, to get a meeting, right? Um, there's multiple ways to to get at it um and you know one you can send a letter of request as a constituent uh we ask that you do that well in advance you know four weeks out uh but making certain that you know you're following up uh to to, to get the meetings uh, and then don't be afraid to walk the halls and knock doors uh to get a meeting uh, in all likelihood, they're not going to respond to the letter, um, but certainly the follow-up calls and and willingness to to knock on doors, catch that scheduler who's sitting right there at the front desk, uh, and getting on the calendar are important ways to get in the meeting. But but again, relationship, relationship, relationship. It's hard to say no if they know you. Next slide. Oh, Josh, you, you, go ahead, jump in. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, I just wanted to add that the process is much more likely to be successful if you are a constituent of that legislator. You probably, many of you already know this, but uh, in most cases, they'll even screen to make, you know, they'll be more likely to make an appointment with you if you are a constituent. Uh, if you're not used to like looking that stuff up, there are a lot of websites all over the place. They'll help you look up your legislator. I know here in Michigan, even the Michigan legislative website will help you look that up. But uh, you want to make sure that the first people you're talking to, uh, you may ultimately build rep, uh, relationships with lots of different people, but the first people that you you want to make your appointments with are probably uh, the people that actually represent you in the House and Senate of your state. Yeah, good, good point. Um, all righty. So now we're going to get into the sort of technical slash wonky part of the our, our presentation. Um, this is this is is really connected to the the process uh, when it comes to moving a bill. We go to the next slide. So you're gonna get real basic here. Certainly, there's three branches of government. We have the judiciary, and that that's where all your judges are. Um, you have the executive branch, which is where. Um, you, if you're at the local level, you're talking about the mayor, you're talking about the governor, if it's the state, and then the president, and then all of the agencies that report to the the um, the the executive uh, is is how I call it, chief executive officer, uh, mayor, governor, president, um, and then you have the legislative branch, um, the House and the Senate 
in the case of the federal um, house and senate in the case of the state and then city council or county um, commissioners uh, would would make up the legislative branches at the very local level um, and it serves as this sort of checks and balances process i'll turn over to you josh next slide Uh, yeah. Um, so the tricky part uh, with a lot of this is that we have kind of an understanding of legislation that sometimes uh, isn't entirely accurate because of the way that we've been taught or whatever. And I think there's a lot of things you have to remember. You have to be really strategic when approaching trying to get legislation passed. Hundreds of pieces of legislation with sponsorship are never heard in committee, never reach the floor for a vote, never go anywhere. There are a number of important stakeholders who determine the fate of your legislation. Uh, it, I think Nikki was talking about this earlier when she was going over the things in our group. Uh, the leaders of either house of the legislature, the governor, the committee chairs of the committee your bill will eventually be heard in, and the leadership of the two parties ultimately all have a lot of influence on if your bill goes anywhere or not. If, um, for instance, you don't have the support of the governor, or the leader of the House or the Senate, it's very unlikely your bill will maybe even get to committee. And if it does get to get gets out of committee, it might never see the floor because those particular people in many states, if not all states, have the power to schedule things and to call for votes. And if they don't call for them, uh, to give you an anecdote, when we were doing the First Step Act work, literally the most complicated moment or the the, the most fraught moment of that entire you know, multiple year uh, amount of work that we did to pass the First Step Act was that nobody knew if 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 Mitch McConnell, the leader of the Senate, was going to uh, let it be scheduled uh, for a vote. And that took that was the one thing that no one was really sure of. So when, uh, you know, some folks finally got him on board to let it come up for a vote, that was really the thing that made the difference of if it was going to pass or not. So some questions you could you should kind of ask in advance, or at least start to uh, someone else ML, I think, was just talking about power mapping that you need to start thinking through is where will the governor be on the bill? Uh, how can I find that out? You know, you need to workshop that kind of thing with folks. Does my bill have to have bipartisan co-sponsors? What's kind of the partisan makeup of our legislature? Uh, who are the likely chairs of the committee the bill will be heard in? Uh, what would the leadership and the leaders of our House and Senate likely think about the bill? How have they looked on other things on criminal justice reform? Uh, how have they looked on, on our issues in general? Do they have any personal stories that would link them into any of the work that you're working on? Uh, and how can you best find that stuff out? Again, I think that can be workshopped or power mapped. Uh, I could probably talk for hours about to, how to approach all of these questions and, and what's on the slide there. So please uh, feel free to reach out and ask me questions if you have any, either at the end of this or, you know, or, or, or in general, uh, my, I'll put my email in the, in the chat in a second. Candia, you want to do the next slide? Yeah. And let me just touch on committee of jurisdiction. Um, some states don't, don't have this sort of jurisdictional thing. I know at the federal level, bills are assigned based on jurisdiction. Um, but really understanding how your state works um, is is important as well um, when it comes to, you know, where you're going to start and how strategic you're going to be in that process. Yeah, that is really important. I mean, there's some states where you can forum shop, like in Michigan, you can definitely uh, try to go through different committees if you're if you're likely not going to get the vote you want in the in the committee that's the normal like criminal justice kind of committee. We can go to the next slide. So the process. Please note influence the process. Um, somebody's going to influence who wins and who loses. Um, so it's important to understand, uh, you know, who your bill sponsor is. And through research, you know, who's going to be that lead uh, on, on your bill. Um, and so once you identify that person and, and they've agreed to be that, uh, then you want to push it through the committee to get a hearing. Uh, Josh talked about 
that. I mean, that's often scheduled by the chairman uh, of that particular committee. Um, and he decides, you know, whether the committee is going to take it up for a vote or not. Um, and so once it's voted, once it's heard and voted out of committee, um, it moves over uh, uh, really to the jurisdiction of leadership at that point. Um, Josh, next slide. Yeah, so one of the real frustrations is that I think most of us probably at some level learned how this all works through uh, Schoolhouse Rock, probably from, you know, that old song. Uh, one of the real frustrations is that even if your bill passes one chamber, you'll then have to start the process all over again in the other chamber. Uh, sometimes if you have a bill package, multiple bills that are trying to accomplish a lot of the same thing, then there is one strategy that, that suggests that you could start one part of the package in one uh, chamber and the other part of the package in the other chamber to try to get buy-in on both sides. But even in that instance, you still have to get the other side of the package passed in the other chamber. I know some of this gets confusing, but eventually your bills or your bill package has to have passed both chambers. Uh, there's one other little confusing thing that's not on the slide that I think is really important. Uh, say that you have your bill uh, pass both the House and the Senate you know, either federally or in your state. And every state has little differences about how this works, but there still is this little peculiarity, which is if they pass a version that's slightly different in either chamber, then there still has to be what's called some form of conference. In some places, it's literally a committee uh, called the conference committee where people get together. That's certainly the case at the federal level. And they have to iron out the differences and come up with a bill again. And then it has to go back through both chambers, that new version, and get voted on again. Now, usually that's not as onerous a process as it sounds like, because when the committee agrees on something, it a lot of times gives it the momentum to go back through those two chambers. But that can be kind of an annoying part of the process. Uh, and, um, you know, there, you know, um, if they don't iron out their differences, then that can be a real problem for your bill. Uh, so yeah, you know, these are all true. The speaker will schedule it, hopefully the floor time for a vote, you get the bill voted on, uh, the bill can be amended on, amended on the floor, the bill then goes to the other chamber, process starts over, and then the bill goes to the governor or the president for their signature, which is a really exciting part as long as they're already on board and want to sign your bill. I've been part of a bunch of those and they're always really exciting. So I'll pass it back over to Kendia. Josh, yeah. I'm going to uh, pause real quick. Oh. Um, Audrey in the chat asked, when does the bill get a number? Uh, uh, I think it's, oh, go ahead, Kendia. Where are you gonna... No, go ahead. You go ahead. Uh, it, it's probably a little bit different on every in every state. I don't know that for sure. Uh, but I know here in Michigan, for instance, uh, when the bill comes out of the writing process and is officially introduced, it gets its number. Mm -hmm. And then to the extent that you uh, have played your politics right, um, I in Pennsylvania, I know that with our Dignity for Incarcerated Women, um, the team was able to actually pick their bill number, um, which was symbolic for, for them to be able to do that. So yeah, e each state is different. Um, so. Here in Michigan, I believe it's sequential, but. Yeah. 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 So whenever you introduce, it's the number right after the last bill that got introduced. So one of the things that we, you know, we talk about when, when we talk about advocacy, um, we often and, and lobbying, we often talk about it in the context of the legislative process. Uh, but let's not underestimate the opportunities that exist within the executive branch for what we do. Um, you know, executive branch proposes budgets, right? Um, and so if, if, if our concern is that we believe that they're, they're funding too many prisons, well, you go to the executive branch and, and protest it. Um, if your concern is you want to see more money go to reentry, uh, you can go in and advocate that they propose a budget with 
you know, more dollars spent on reentry uh, or education. So depending on what your issue is, you can you can work the front end um, and and get the executive branch to propose something that's consistent with with your values. Um, and once that money is approved, uh, you know, you can certainly advocate for it to be directed in a way that, that, that you see fit. So, you know, don't underestimate the relationships that you can build at the executive level uh, to advance your call, uh, cause rather. And as you know, there are a number of, of RFPs and RFQs that they put out for contracts um, related to either your core business or your core issue. Job training dollars are flowing through there all the time. Uh, again, so if you're doing reentry work, there are opportunities for grants uh, for your organization. Um, you know, if you know of businesses that hire uh, people who have been incarcerated uh, and they're applying for either grant dollars or contracts, um, you know, you can push them, push the president, push the governor, push the mayor um, to to offer points for for companies that hire people who are formerly incarcerated. Um, and, and the legislature often and always, let me say, I, I say often, always refer the bills to the impacted agency. Um, so if you're if you're looking to reform, you know, the 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 prisons or uh doing sentencing reforms, they're, they're gonna ask the the police department, uh, they're going to ask the state troopers or they're going to ask the DOJ, you know, what their opinion is on certain issues. They're going to ask the prosecutors what their opinion or the attorney general, what their opinion is on the issue. Uh, and so you want to be able to um, influence policy uh, at the departmental level uh, because they do listen to the recommendations of the departments. Can I give a quick example of the budget thing real quick? Is that your thing? Yeah. So um, in Michigan, a couple of years ago, uh, we were trying to reduce prison phone fees and we knew that we were proposing legislation to do that. And we knew that was going to be very difficult to get passed. Uh, but we also knew that there were other ways, you know, pardon the, the saying, but to skin this cat. And so um, we started out trying to go because there's an appropriation process uh, in, in most states. Uh, and if you understand the appropriation process in your state, there's sometimes opportunities. So we started out trying to meet with the leaders of the, the, the committees that oversaw the, the Department of Corrections budget, and we were trying to negotiate with them. And we were getting okay with that, but it still wasn't going great. So we started to have meetings with the governor's office and we found out that the governor was interested in this to some extent. And so she put it in her executive recommendation, what we wanted, which will ultimately be ended up being about a 40% reduction in fees. Uh, she actually uh, put it in her executive recommendation for the budget. And then because there wasn't a lot of opposition to just that part, it wasn't everything we were trying to do in the legislation. It was just that reduction. It actually went through and we, and last year we got a 40% reduction in phone fees. So, you know, knowing that there, the, the process for the different part, the different parts of the legislative process in your state is really important. Maybe. We can go to the next slide. Uh, this is always my favorite. Channel your inner Denzel Washington, your inner Tom Hanks, your inner Viola Davis as you prepare for the meeting. Um, you know, what you want to do is be prepared. ML talked about this early on. Uh, and the reason why I use these, these three as examples, because if you've ever read an article on their approach to their role, they do a lot of research on the characters that they're playing. You know, they want to understand what their motivation is, what makes them tick, 
you know, how they're going to react in certain scenarios. They, they, they really pour into each and every one of these characters. Uh, and so when you approach these meetings, you want to understand who it is you are uh, approaching. Who, who are you meeting with? Uh, what makes them tick? What influences them? What drives them to be and do what they do? Um, and so you want to know your congressperson. Uh, and in doing that research, and, and as you're preparing, you want to look for opportunities to connect and establish common ground. That's so critical uh, when you are going into these meetings. Uh, Zach talked about it. Um, you might have a left-leaning perspective, uh, but understand if you're going in and speaking with someone who leans heavily to the right of, of the political spectrum, what language do they use when they talk about criminal justice reform? Uh, what language are they using? Is, is Do they approach it from a Christian value standpoint? Do they approach it from a government overreach perspective? Are they approaching this from a, we've made, spent a lot of money in this space and we're not getting a return on our investment? Um, but understand the language that they use. And it's as you have that understanding, it, that's where you can find common ground to advance uh, your initiative. Um, and then when you show up, be natural and be genuine, right? Um, people see through, you know, folks who aren't being natural and genuine. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of like the breakdown of things to remember uh, as you're, once you've gotten your appointment and it's time, you're about to show up and do your thing. Uh, these are just some important things to remember. Uh, the first one, uh, I think ML already talked about, which is that everyone is important. If you show up for your meeting and you've got, you've worked and you're ready and you're prepped and all that, and it turns out to be a staff person instead of the legislature, don't get upset. That's not necessarily a bad thing. A lot of times the, the staff person is the person who actually informs the legislator of what they should do policy-wise. And so sometimes it's more important to sell the staff than it is in some cases to even sell the legislator. In addition to that, you have to look at, you know, most of the uh, battles I've been a part of have taken years. And you have to look at trying to create a relationship with an office because you're not going to just meet with them once if you're moving forward and they're on your side. You're going to meet with them multiple times. So you want to know everybody in that office. And so you should look at it as an opportunity to get to know the people in that office. Now, once you're in the the the, the meeting, what are the things that you do? I think these are kind of the basics. Uh, the first thing you should always start out by thanking the legislator for the meeting. Uh, just like I said before, we're building relationships. Often the legislative process takes years. You want to find you you want a really strong and good relationship. And even if you disagree, there might be things you come back later on different issues and you want to talk to that person again. The better that relationship starts off, the better chance you have to be able to communicate with them in the future. Uh, you know, uh, you want to introduce yourself and you want to try to do it in as concise a manner as possible. Uh, you know, I know this sounds a little bit ridiculous, but I used to practice with a timer until I got to the point where I, I had a good sense in my head of how long it took me to get messages out or particular messages out. I can't tell you how many times I've been in legislative meetings with groups of people where some where we have 20 minutes for the meeting and the first person who talks takes like seven or eight minutes introducing themselves. That's not very helpful. You wanna to get to the most important stuff, which is trying to convince that legislator or get that legislator on board for whatever your legislative process is. Um, so you want to do that as quickly as possible. I would say try to get it down to under a minute. Try to include the most important stuff in the least amount of time possible. Uh, what is the old saying? Brevity is the soul of wit. Uh, you should lay out an agenda and purpose for the meeting. You know, I would, you know, just as a, an example, I'd say something like, I'm hoping to talk to you today about supporting legislation that would allow for a second look for people with long and indeterminate sentences. I'd like to talk to you about why it's important 
what the legislation might look like and why you should support it. That's called a preview. When I, you know, if you're doing public speaking kind of stuff, that's called a preview. And so you've given them an idea of what the entire part, your part of the meeting is going to look like. Uh, next, you should probably remember that one of the most effective mechanisms you have for convincing people is personal stories. Uh, you should definitely, uh, tell your stories and try to figure out which ones are the most persuasive ones. But remember uh, that the same thing I said above about being concise is really important. You don't want your story to take up the entire time. So practice it in advance, maybe even practice it in front of some people that you might be going to the meeting for with or who understand what you're talking about. Um, also, and this is just kind of one of those things I've seen go off the rails a bunch of times, unless you've been exonerated and you're being innocent is part of your story. Try not to get caught up in the legal details of your case or to talk about your innocence if you were found guilty, et cetera. Talk more about the bill and why it matters and what and, and tell stories about uh, that demonstrate why not passing the bill would actually harm real people. Try not to relitigate your case. Mostly what ends up happening when that happens is it tends to turn legislators off. If it's fair or unfair, the first thing that they think is, oh, this is that kind of thing. And so you just, you want to make it more about why the issue is important and less about relitigating issues of thing uh, of your particular case, in my experience. Uh, at the end of your presentation, make the ask. And what, what that means is that you should ask them if they will agree to support the legislation or whatever you're suggesting that they should do. And even if they don't give you the answer you want, it's important to make a demand, to put something out there that they have to connect to and make a decision on. Uh, you at least start to get an idea of where they're coming from or what they feel. Uh, then I think it's really important, again, to thank them for their time. And even if they disagree with you, be really, you know, be very polite about it and stuff like that. Because like I said, you could come back to them for other things. They may change their mind. You're establishing relationships. And then a lot of times in a lot of states, I know this is true where, where I'm at, um, it, you know, ask if it would be okay to take a picture with them. You know, I mean, just do things like, you know, a lot of people do that. It creates a record of the meeting for you. And, you know, and, 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 and uh, you know, I think it's very uh, effective. So I'll pass it back over to Candia. Yeah. And if I may, on the everybody is important piece, and I want to touch on the ask, but the, you know, we, when when you go to these meetings, um, that's that person who greets you at the front door or that intern is often the intern of an influential pastor who and he or she happens to be in away in college and in need of a job, right? And so you treat that intern bad, they go back and tell, you know, dad that this person treated me bad. Now that influential pastor is telling the legislator, can you believe what these folks at Dream Corps are about? So treat everyone as if they are a part of the decision-making process. And how does that ask, when we talk about the ask, right? How does that ask look when it's not the congressperson? You know, the way that I sometimes frame it is, do you feel comfortable making, asking your boss, recommending to your boss rather that he or she co-sponsor this piece of legislation, right? So you're not asking them to support it. We're, you're asking them to make the recommendation to their boss, right? So again, as Josh said, they will likely punt on something like that, uh, but you still want to put the ass down because we made that ask um, and out of 20 times making that ask, we got one person uh, that is Senator Burr's staff to say yes, and he ultimately co-sponsored the piece of legislation. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting thing at the end there too. I think it's important to strategize about what your ask should be, and I probably should have mentioned that. 
uh, you really should try to think about what it is you ultimately want to get out. Maybe you want a sponsorship. Maybe you want a co-sponsorship. Maybe you just want them to vote for the legislation. Maybe you want them to talk to other legislators. You know, maybe you want them, you know, maybe they're the, the whip and you're trying to get them to help, you know, figure out what the uh, what the count's going to be for things. There's all kinds of things that you could be asking them about. Be really strategic about what the ask is. You should make an ask, but you should be really thoughtful about what the ask is. And uh, Josh and Kendia, sorry to rush you along, but um, just doing a quick time check. I know we've got 10 minutes and uh, two slides left. Um, did want to create some space for Q&A. Um, so just uh, wanted to flag that. Yeah, much of this is review and, and reinforcing points that, that we've already made. Um, so I'll just go through them really quickly. Legislators, they care about what you, their constituents, want. Um, because at the end of the day, the power lies with you, you, the the general you, the broader sense you. Um, and so because you're the one that that reelects them. Right. Um, stories are moving. Uh, and, and you know, I know it's not always comfortable to share your story, but, you know, don't be afraid. They've gotten us countless. Again, all of our the co-sponsors we we're able to get get it's often the response at the conclusion of the meeting that that was a very moving story powerful story um common ground look to connect i think we talked about that uh at, at in detail and so we don't want to we don't need to go into details there um and then when you are speaking across the aisle this is always a bipartisan issue, right? No, nothing's partisan, even though, you know, you, you may be left-leaning. This isn't, the, criminal justice reform is a bipartisan issue. Next slide. We can go to the next slide. It's the next slide. Oh, is it? No. Oh, oh, tips for the meeting still. Oh, Josh, are you going to handle? You want me to take it or? Uh, I does You know, I mean, these are things that I already had just kind of talked about. Be respectful. Make sure that you really treat everybody. You're trying to establish relationships and good relationships with everyone you meet. Uh, be very concise. Like I said, you can even go to the point where you start practicing. You don't want to practice where you're trying to remember every single word, but you're trying to practice where the concept of what you're trying to get across, you're getting across as quickly as possible in the shortest amount of time. Uh, and don't be discouraged again with the staff. We talked about that several times, I think. Uh, staffers are really important, and it's part of establishing the relationship with the office. All righty. Q&A. So, Zach, I saw you uh, raised your hand. Um, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, um, I, I didn't necessarily have a question. Um, I just wanted to, um, so, like, around... Um, like related to like the message about like connecting with legislators. Um, uh, uh, so my like with my coalition, I focus on the Thirteenth Amendment, and within our, um, I, I've also have an acknowledgement. I was like, while we advocate for ad, uh, inequities related to the use of prison labor in the Thirteenth Amendment exception, our coalition stands in solidarity with victims of all forms of modern slavery, human trafficking, and crime. Um, our our sole focus is abolishing the Thirteenth Amendment while creating safer pathways for public safety. So. That's like, you know, you can acknowledge, you know, because there's people that are victims of crime, there's, you know, modern slavery, there's human trafficking, all. So just making like those acknowledgements, um, you know, because like otherwise sometimes your message can be uh, misconstrued. Talk about yeah, I think to, to add to that, you know, one of the things I try to do is not talk about criminal justice reform. I almost always try to start out with the public safety message. You know, mm -hmm. I try to say whatever I'm supporting that there's a that that what I'm doing is good for public safety. Uh, because that's really the elephant in the room a lot of the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I just wanted to thank the um, the, the host for uh, speaking today. I appreciated the um, expertise. So. Yeah, th thank you. Thanks for your participation too. Um, any other? I see yeah. a question in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Says, would it still bear fruit to engage with legislators with whom you don't see eye to eye? Uh, it really, I mean, yes, I think the short answer is yes. I've spent a lot of time engaging with legislators who I don't see eye to eye with if we were going to 
actually talk about the things because a lot of times the issue here's an example when i was at the detroit film festival talking about the first step back documentary uh the moderator asked me uh do you think it was all worth it and i started laughing without even thinking about it because i was like thirty thousand people got out of prison because of that bill at the time it's actually more now and of course it was worth it that's the whole reason we do this work for a lot of us and i think um you know there were a lot of people that I had to interact with during that uh, two years that aren't people that I would normally talk to under any circumstances. But the you have to put the goal of what you're doing first. Now, I think this what you're really asking is there are certain things. I mean, are there times when your energy is not worth putting it into that? Like you're not going to get the bill that you want. And I think that's really just a question you have to ask yourself. And I think if you come to a point where you don't think that what's going to pass is going to benefit the people you're fighting for anymore, then you probably should say, I don't support this anymore. Maybe don't reach against it. But most states in the United States, you can't pass legislation unless you work with both sides. Uh, it's just, just the way our politics works. It's, it's a, the, the system is built to create consensus legislation uh, is the best way I could put it. Yeah. And you, you won't, particularly if you're working in, in, in a um, largely Republican state, right? Um, and, and you're looking to advance some of these issues, uh, you're going to have to go into to offices where they don't agree with you. Um, now, you don't have to agree with them on everything, right? I mean, you're going in about a specific issue. Uh, you may you may not get them on climate change, but can you get them on, you know, your bill, criminal justice reform? Um, certainly, if you have enough people in the legislature that already agree with you, then maybe you don't have to go to the other side. Uh, but more often than not, you have to reach across the aisle uh, in order to, to get something done, to get your bill passed. Um, Mr. Quigley, did you have a, a, a question? Oh, oh, yeah, thanks. Now, I just wanted to make a quick comment about your all's group. Uh, everybody here has got a job. If you want a job in the political process, find my contact information in this chat. Uh, I don't use Slack, but I've just put my contact information up here in this Slack. I mean, in this uh, chat, I'm running for president of the United States, and we got a ton of jobs to fill. So if you're interested in real uh, uh, policy changes and law changes, uh, contact me, please, because you guys sound like a very smart, intelligent group with an awful lot of grassroots experience. And we would love to have you on our team. So that's some comment I was going to make. Yeah. All right. And, and I will, I, I do want to state Two for the record, we are at 501c3, um, and as an organization, we do not endorse candidates. Um, yeah, and, but as an as an individual, individuals can get involved. 501c3 no, cannot no, legally no, I, get involved. I'm just I'm I'm just stating for the purposes of of who we are. I'm not speaking. I'm speaking largely to everyone who's here to know that we're this isn't, and you know we don't endorse a candidate. Uh, your presence here is out of interest over the issue about the issue that we're covering. Uh, I'm just sort of safeguarding our 501c3 status. Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Endorsement. Uh, so, uh, ML. Um, uh, you said what were you talking about? Oh, talking about uh, engaging with people across the aisle. You know, that don't agree with you. Um, the person who asked the question. Um, you you really have to. Um, especially in red states, which I am in one, if a Republican does not um, sponsor a bill and, and they don't support it, you're nine times out of 10 not going to get your bill passed. So you do have to find areas of common ground. Um, like Josh said, uh, come to discussions and, and talk about public safety um, and talk about things like the budget. You know, of course, we are here to reform the prison system and, and et cetera. But when we're talking about money and how much DOC waste and you know how the budget, that's what gets those people's, you know, going. Not necessarily 
um, you know, our family members being horribly treated per se, because that it is the truth, but they sometimes feel like, well, you shouldn't have did what you did to get in prison. So you really need to work with those people, but you have to find the language that's going to pique their interest. Um, and what I do normally, personally, I mute and block politicians like on my socials, my own social. So I don't see what they say because they say some crazy stuff in my state. So, and I don't want to even be tempted to like see something that irritates me and say, you know what I mean? Say something. So I really like mute them. So I don't even see it, you know what I'm saying? Unless somebody brings it to me, but I really try to disengage from who they are because I don't like it. Even the part, like I have a bill in my state. I don't like the person that sponsors it, that filed it. However, this person knows the issue that I'm fighting and he agrees with it. So we're working together. But on other things, you know, he's not, you know, somebody that I would ride with. So you really have to take your own personal views. And if you can reach that person on a small area, work with them, you know, use criminal um, public safety and the, the money and you know, cutting down waste and those sorts of uh, things and reach out to them, you know, that. You have to work with those people, like I said, especially in, in red states. I don't know, but in red states, if you're not engaged with the other side, you're not going to get anything done. So just wanted to add that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that uh, I've learned over the years is that you also have to learn. I mean, a lot of what I was talking about earlier about relationship building. So if you just meet someone and you don't have a relationship, they're more likely, you're more likely to hear political talking points. You're more likely to have uh, less of a real conversation over time, the more you get to know someone, the more you can break through that and have real conversations. And so there are people who I've disagreed with vociferously on hundreds of issues who we find common ground. And sometimes you learn things like that they have friends that were formerly incarcerated or that one of their family members is formerly incarcerated, or, you know, that happens on every, in every kind of politics and every kind of uh, party, you're going to have people uh, who have been impacted by it. There's so many people. You know, one of the things I used to say is that one of the only silver linings of mass incarceration is that it's mass incarceration. It affects everybody. And so everybody has some connection to it. All righty. So I think that Harrison, did we, uh, we, we, we went over two minutes. You, you, you will forgive us, huh? You covered all your bases and then some. <laughs> well, I put everybody, I, I want to thank everyone for their attention. Um, and to the extent that you have any questions, um, you know, feel free to to reach out uh, to myself or Josh. I think I put my, yep, my information is in the chat there. Um, we welcome your questions. We welcome your participation in our uh, lobby day training as well as going forward your participation in all of our efforts uh, to reform our criminal legal system. Um, and to the extent that there are days of empathies on the horizon in your community, uh, we encourage your participation there as well. Like Tori dropped in the chat, I'll, I'll drop it one more time. Uh, there we go, Tori did already. Uh, we have events coming up in Oregon, Nebraska, Missouri, uh, hosted by uh, Michelle Smith, who's on this call uh, with us today, Wisconsin, Mississippi, Kentucky, Ohio, Georgia, and Pennsylvania coming up. Uh, and oh, Michigan tomorrow. Give, uh, and Michigan, um, yes. Uh, and um, I want to also give a shout out to uh, Carla Youngblood, who's on the call, who hosted a fantastic Washington Day of Empathy. <laughs> Yeah, they, they were on Thank jam you. in Washington. Thank you, Harrison. Thank you, Candace. All righty. Jessica, you got California next year. All right, well, if, if there's nothing else for the good of the order, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All righty. <laughs> Third. <laughs> Thank you all so much. We'll uh, figure out the music situation next year or uh, next next time. <laughs> Have a great evening.